way to young artists uh, get the work right and it will lead to things. Just naturally unfolds and that's what life is like and that people respond to intensity and concentration and thought. My entry into the Ramsey Art Prize is for large scale underwater landscapes. I entered a painting work that's called Hollow Stones Fall from Great Heights. My piece is called Memorial. It's done on scratchboard. So I've submitted a portrait of my partner Simon Tedeschi who is a concert pianist. The work that I've submitted for the Ramsey Art Prize are large semi-transparent scrims that hang and float in space. In Australia, it's incredibly difficult to be a mid-career artist, so once emerging falls away and you haven't reached the stage where you're going to have monographs about your work, I mean, we're talking decades of tumbleweeds. My average income is about 20000 a year, which is not very much. Whatever I make in that year, I have to put at least half of that back into the practice, so I'm living off, like, the smell of an oily rag. You sort of develop a way of living that is just geared towards making work. So, I don't know. I don't know any other way of being, really. Does, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. I haven't decided to become an artist. It is something by birth. Art funding in Australia is very poor, generally. There are limited opportunities for artists. Um, so when an opportunity comes up, you tend to jump on it. For this little one. For this little one, indeed. <laughs> There's a long mid-career phase where you're still, you're always making work, you're always developing new ideas. How are you going to get your voice heard? How are you going to get your work out there? Prizes like the Ramsey Art Prize are focused on that particular phase. This prize, which is looking at some of the best work by people under 40 in Australian art, it's an inaugural, it's the first of that. I think just to enter and to be involved in a prize is exposure than if there is the possibility of then winning, which is great. But for myself, I always tell people, you know, j just enter, like that there is, why wouldn't you? My mother is looking after these garden. My father's looking after flowers. They were injured in a suicide bombing in, on 31st of August in 2011. When they came here, they were going through post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a good lifestyle to, you know, to keep, keep them busy. Being an artist, I think that life is very short against the art. There's a lot of uh, people who are famous for nothing. But there are a lot of people who are busy in their own work and I, I want to have that uh, satisfaction that they have without being famous. My, my first priority is, of course, family. Then my second priority is my art. I don't agree on that, on that one. You don't agree on that? Okay. No. His art, I would say he prioritises his art um, a lot. That um, sometimes does create a lot of argument, but still, um, I understand at the end. 
Okay. Yeah, sometimes I pretend that I'm a caring person. <laughs> Just want to be him to be happy in, with his art and uh, whatever his aim is to achieve in the art field, just to achieve that. You know, I guess some of the highest level markers of success, if you're judging it in terms of art world success, would be the Venice Biennale. That's successful for one person and one artist, but success can look like a whole bunch of other things. Like if you've had an amazing practice that you've developed and created beautiful objects that have brought meaning to people's lives, like that's, that's successful. I think everyone has their own measures for success. For some people it's audiences, for some people it's sustainability. Can they afford to feed their family and keep their studio practice alive? I don't think there is this kind of clear trajectory and I think what's really difficult for artists is that it becomes more unsustainable the further you go. You can't be an artist without having a thick skin. Um, you need to be able to take rejection constantly. You need to convince people that are already artists or already making art or already in the art world that your work has some kind of uh, meaning, some kind of significance. The decision is often in the hands of others. Someone might choose to be an artist, but if you want to make a profession of it and you need to feed your family and that kind of stuff, there's only so many ways that you can do that, you know? How did you do that? Um, well, it's a struggle, constantly. Even with kind of, you know, some commercial success, it can still not be enough even to, to like, have an art practice and live on at the same time, especially in a city like Sydney. Really, it's kind of a patchwork. You know, I've worked in restaurants for a long time and uh, do bar work as well. I'm fortunate to get some teaching work at the moment. And there's a few months there without anything quite often, so you just do what you need to, I guess. I sink a lot of money into my art, so it's important that I have an income stream. Don't go blind. I do real estate photography for a couple of agencies, and I do some copywriting as well. Because I work all these casual and freelance jobs, I'm working like seven days a week, and sometimes I'm doing like 16 hours a day. You just have to do that because there'll be periods where you have no work. We spent the first few weeks just thinking, what have we done? I used to think I was tired. Now I know a new level of tired. At the moment, it's about time, about how much time she requires. And that's the biggest threat to me having a practice. If it came to a point where it was compromising her well-being, I'd, I guess I'd have to quit. I'd be miserable. I would be so miserable, but yeah. Goodness, <laughs> I guess that's what happens. That's what happens when you parent. Suddenly she comes first. The goal for me is to have my practice be able to sustain itself and the other parts of my life. I don't need a million dollars. I just want to be able to live comfortably and keep making. There's definitely financial incentive in Sydney to share spaces. It's crazy. The people who are artists here are artists because they're really sure they want to and the financial pressure means that you can't take that decision lightly. Usually we paint together, but since I had a baby and I know this painting needs to be done, Nesh has been coming in and painting on her own a lot more. We've just got to find funds to pay Nesh. She said that I didn't have to pay her, yeah. but that's just, that's not a thing. But I love doing it. I know you do, but it's a job. I'm quite adamant about it because I used to, like, I have relatives who think that art's a hobby. Yeah. It's a job. So you'll be paid for your work. Just between us, it's not like I'm making buckets of money from doing this. I'm very lucky if I get a show every two years. Like, I'm very grateful about that. If I sold every single work in the show, I mean, this has never happened, <laughs> but maybe like $100,000 for the whole show if you add up all the work. And then the gallery's commission is 40%. So that's $30,000 one year and the next year to get to the show. 
It's, so it's no financial incentive, you know? Takes a bit to get this going sometimes. I tend to try and use a lot of natural light. I haven't built up the back of the head yet, so... Part of me feels as though the work becomes performance in making these images and the performance part of it isn't revealed or is only suggested. Does it feel a bit like we've sort of invaded your space? Yeah, it does a bit. It's, it's very... Um, well, you just feel like a bit of a dick, really, you know. <laughs> Anouk doesn't even bat an eyelid at what I do at home. Oh, Mummy's got shaving cream on again. I think there's always a deflation, actually, when you do this stuff. A bit of that sort of self-loathing of going, oh, God. Can I not think of a better way to make artwork than this? Like, this <laughs> doesn't feel very sophisticated. These are the works that are going in the Ramsey Art Prize. And it's a block of 15 works that are designed to be seen as a grid. So they were made as one work. They're me, they're all me, they're all versions of me, but none of them is me and they're all experiences I feel about being in my body, but none of them is a permanent, defined one. So this is the work that I submitted to the Ramsey Prize, alt-right arabesque. It happened so quickly, in a sense, and it came out in such intensity that I was still, and I still am, I guess, thinking about the, the kinds of things that are happening in the work. It's a work that sits in that kind of realm, the sort of uncanny, surreal, everything's normal but a little bit different, which I guess speaks to the political context that we're living in. It's sort of like, it's a way of just asking people to think about what's happening. I definitely have like a love-hate relationship with art prizes, I think. I find them really stressful. You know, it puts you against people that, you know, you, you respect and you admire. And there's this kind of inherent thing, you know, prizes create losers. You know, they create lots of losers and usually um, that's where most of us are. So it's always this complex emotional roller coaster. So this is, and again, back to the kind of doubt thing, like, you know, there's, there's constant um, stimulus for doubt in the art world. These careers are long, they are lifetimes. Art prizes buy time, and time is what an artist needs in order to develop, to invest in themselves, which can take you up to the next level, and that's so important. The work that you're finishing off here could potentially win you $100,000. <laughs> that's very surreal. These things are such long shots. It's just great to be in it and you can't afford to think about... Like I've been in so many art prizes, you can't afford to think about what you do with the money because then it's like you're setting yourself up for disappointment and I don't want to do that, so... Not very happy when I can't paint. I think better when I'm painting about everything and um, I feel more like me. So that gets rid of the white canvas. I wasn't sure if I wanted to have kids. It's hard. A lot of women artists don't have children just because you're so damn terrified that you're going to lose everything that you've just spent your whole adult life trying to develop. And you're so conscious that the opportunities for women artists with children get harder to find. It's been incredibly hard to keep working and work at the pace that I want to work. But I'm so glad I did. It's also made me grow up a lot and it's made me have to just stand and face the world more directly. I can't think of any other way I would have had that 
change. Are you happy with what you're creating right now? No, because <laughs> I can't talk and paint at the same time. It's two different parts of my brain. There you go. Here I am now, standing in front of the most prestigious wall in Sydney. And it's huge, and I have my say now. And this is bigger than me now. How long did this take to make? Uh, one month plus my whole life. These figures are the victims of war, jumping on the boat, risking their life. They've been demonized or dehumanized in their own land, and then they have big beards, long ears, and goat horns, and no similarities in the facial feature with the normal Australian here. These works are in support of the refugees who came, who are coming here or who came here. I'm showing my solidarity with them. Like, let's say if this work of mine wins the Ramsey Prize, this would become news. And I would have my say on the newspapers, on the media. If not, then it might get collected by some art collector, but never become news. Well, at the moment, I'm preparing the work to head down for the Ramsey Prize. The work is all here in its different components, and I need to just investigate a little bit more how the work will be pulled together. I think there's something really amazing about the imagery of people on ashtrays and what it actually means metaphorically to kind of take a cigarette and to butt out on someone's culture or butt out on someone's face or someone's head. What it is to have, you know, take someone's culture, take someone's land and then continue to deprive them. I mean, the act, I think, of putting a cigarette out on someone is a really kind of perfect metaphor for that. I feel extraordinarily privileged to be able to sustain a life just as an artist. I, mean, I don't know very many people that are. Um, even in a successful realm as an artist, most people still have kind of some job. But in saying that, it took a long time to get to that point. As artists, I think we're relying much more heavily on philanthropic enterprises, on patrons, when a patron is willing to give so generously, you know, maybe for us as artists, it's kind of to step up to that challenge and show not just the art community, but, you know, the broader public how important art is. I don't think that any artist has ever followed in exactly the same path of another artist because it's so, such an individual pursuit you know, so much about it is getting your voice out there. So any way that you can be heard, and a gallery space is usually the way forward, is, um, is, going, to, is going to do you well. Our general philosophy as an art gallery is that if the artist has done what we've agreed that they're going to do, and they have been accepted into here as a represented artist, that they're going to work really hard to have the show. Therefore, the least we can do is work really hard to find people to collect it. And people don't just wake up in the morning and decide to spend $20,000 on a painting. They generally will need 
a lot of discussion. It might take a year to get them to the, the idea that this is someone they should look for. And so that's our job, is to be in constant contact with, with our collector base. We didn't start buying art with the goal to be collectors. So we purchased art because we, we liked it and it's just taken on a life of its own. So this is a work that classically people either love or they loathe. Um, and this one people find really difficult, the Sam Jinx baby. I must admit I don't really care if people don't like it. I have to like it because I live with it. It's just beautiful. I have to think how many we do. We have <laughs> hundreds. We have, we have hundreds. This work was in the Adelaide Biennium. Correct, we bought it before that though. Yeah. The perfection in the painting itself, absolute perfection. It's glorious. Artists often make us stop and think. They make us reflect on ourselves in a way or can. There is that sense of this enables them to continue that and that's their role in our society. The artists need someone to buy it. And if it's not the institution, it's the um, it's the collectors. And often these days, it's the collectors buying because the institutions don't have the funds. Mm. It's more than just the works on the wall. It's a people, a very much a people thing. And the grandchildren love it. They can sit down and look up. Fascinated by it, fascinated. Uh, and some people come in and they just go, oh my God, what's that? A lot of my teachers in year 11 and 12, they preferred two-dimensional art. And I just wanted to make installations and weird sculptural works. And then I eventually just thought, you know, oh, I'm not a good artist, you know? So I stopped there. But I came back to it eventually because I knew I needed to follow that passion. Yeah, I was really happy and lucky I got into the School of Art Sculpture Workshop. It captured something essential to me and gave it life. So I feel really like a proper whole person now, <laughs> yeah. So that's my submission to the Ramsey Art Prize, La Pin Plague, and it's an installation made of old carpet and rabbit forms, warm creatures I made that are spread out along there. People often won't want to engage with artwork physically because they've been told all their lives not to, but I encourage that with most of my work for people to step in and touch and even listen. So these are like, these were spares. They're all wired up, ready to be hooked in, but they, so then I'd stitch on the old coats, so I'd cut them up and sneeze a lot, because um, I'm kind of allergic. And they'd get wired up under the carpet once they have the rabbit fur and the extra stuffing underneath. Yeah. So that guy who you met at the window. And that's Lana over there. Maurice escaped earlier. It, it was a really weird time where I was working with fox pelts and they were, they looked so similar to Sky, and it just made me so sad and I couldn't separate myself from that for a really long time. My art has been like me working through my own feelings and rationalizations around uh, animals and animal consumption and animal exploitation. That's good, I think. I grew up as a, especially during my adolescence, just an incredibly anxious, depressed human being. And I'd have good times, but just a lot of self-hate and just feels like this massive, deep well of like hellishness that you can't escape from. Like you're just trapped in a fog and you don't know how you're gonna get out, but eventually you do. And then you remember that each time.
So I still feel down sometimes, but I feel like it's not massive, you know? And I think it's important to feel down sometimes. My art is a little bit about demonstrating that. I was in a pretty rough place when I was about 20. Um, I was getting in trouble a lot and being arrested and selling drugs and stuff like that. All my male role models in my life had been to prison, so I think it was pretty, pretty normal. I would have been interested in science and physics and chemistry and, and history. Like, I had enough of an education to get me to art school, but I didn't have enough to get me to the things that I potentially wanted to do. I basically just ended up focusing on issues that I think are important in Australia through photography. So this is the work going to the Ramsey called Karawari Yuta, which means River Red Gum Forest Place. It's the Ghana name for Nudri, which are the people from the Barossa area. So I did it as someone of Ghana heritage, reflecting on Nudri culture. Basically, I etched in shield designs from South Australia to just indicate Aboriginal people who were on the lands that were dispossessed by the Angus family or the South Australian company, which was run by George Fife Angus. At first, there was a bit of hesitation about this work, and then the family engaged with it. It didn't really upset the family because they understand what their family's legacy has done to Aboriginal people. In many ways, like it was less about the photographs, but more about the conversation about colonisation, I guess. Art for me is an opportunity to experience the world as other people feel it or perceive it. And that experience should be altering. You know, we're not living in a time of truth. We're living in a time where uncertainty and its boundaries are more prevalent than ever before. And if artists and their ideas can do something to speak to an audience and to provide a third alternative, then that's really powerful. And culture is still a great space for that conversation and encounter to incur. For an audience, if you come in and you experience a piece of art, um, and if you have a moment of beauty, a moment of wonder, a moment of anger, a moment of sadness, whatever it is, and whether that moment is profound or just small and passing, you've still stopped for a second and you've thought in a different way, you've opened up other possibilities, and that's really rich and really important and not something that we get to do many other times. But I guess the best artists are diligent and committed they develop their craft, they develop their practice day in, day out, through the ups and the downs. I just want to copy the footsteps of my grandfather, great-grandfather. Indigenous way they call it my grandfather, but European way he's my great-great-grandfather. Albert Namatjira, an Australian Aboriginal of the Aranda tribe. I didn't even know I was a Namajira because I was growing up under another name by the name of Brewpecker. That was the name they gave me, Vincent Brewpecker. My birth name was Namajira. That's when I found out when I was 18 because when you're raised in captivity and welfare, you can't go back and just learn straight away. You lose everything and they tell you, no lingo, you're here in foster care. We don't speak lingo in this house. I had to go back and start all over again to learn Aranda, speak that language again. I sat down night and day, listened to children talking, playing. They've been teaching me, kids. I've been learning two weeks. Yeah, you lose everything culture and all. I don't want to be known as an Albert Namajira figure, but I want to be known as a Vincent Namajira figure. Their name is connected. It's part of me. 
if I'm painting that amateur landscape, makes me like I am Albert. I don't want to be like him. The feeling inside, the watercolor, the landscape, passed away with him. It's my turn to bring something up now. And by the way, this is the men's side. Over there's the lady's side. What happens if you get mixed up? Uh, hassle. <laughs> Sometimes I like fighting with the painting, too. Sometimes it's winning, I'm winning. It's like, war. I'm going to fight with this painting, you know? And when it's finished, I'm the winner. Sometimes, now and then, we have requests on the email from galleries they want more paintings of mine. I'm enjoying it, because the more I do, the more I get famous, you know? The more I get big, my name gets big. Well, everyone will know me. The British Museum has a collection of some 6,000 pieces from Australia. Having a work like Vincent's Captain Cook with a Declaration is one way of showing something that's a little familiar in a new light. The second painting we acquired was The Queen and Me, and we acquired that for our permanent collection. These are the works that are going to be entered into the Ramsey Art Prize Award. Seven richest people of Australia. They live in a good condition. Out here, we live in a poor condition, you know? Just more. And they're wealthy. But I don't want to be making a discrimination or criticizing. It's just me painting the white people, rich and powerful. I painted these so I could see which one had the most money and where did the money come from. That's all I painted it. It's not unusual to put something up four to five times to get it right. That's it. Job's done. Because it's a prize, it's about making it kind of stand alone and yet talk to the other works. And it's really about keeping in mind the viewer's experience, that the viewer's going to walk in and say, OK, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. So we've got the challenge of four relatively small gallery spaces, how 21 finalists will best kind of speak or best be presented in those spaces. I just started making these installations that took me sort of like two days to do. So most things come from Bunnings, Kmart and uh, there's a Buddhist store in Sydney. It's sort of my take on a Taoist Buddhist shrine. <laughs> that this is supposed to represent um, in a really basic way sex, death and birth. It's just a part of life, you know. So. It's, it's not that nice to have people watching. Sort of like having your parents watch you have sex or something. Yeah. <laughs> not that that's ever happened, but you know. <laughs> I am quite disciplined, so I like to exercise in the morning. So normally six days a week, I'll either go to the gym or I'll go for a run around Happy Valley race course. Artists are a bit like drift nets. And often what you find is when an artist is given the opportunity just to go and research experience and be embedded in a different context, that they often produce some of the most wildly ambitious and most interesting kind of alterations in their practice. And it's not surprising to me that the Ramsey would be strongly represented by artists who produce works in residencies because it also that time away allows artists the space to create something with a level of ambition. 
I find the creative process, and especially residencies, it's all about the immersion and the immersive experience so that you're totally absorbing what you're seeing and hearing and feeling. You're gathering materials all the time and then it's only in hindsight when you look back over your shoulder that you've gone home that you can really start to piece together the things that were meaningful to you at the time. Um, when I arrived in Hong Kong, I was immediately drawn to the amazing bamboo scaffolding on these buildings which they use for construction. Often there's a mesh, a beautiful semi-translucent mesh that they sort of attach to it as well. So it's like an external skin, it's quite beautiful. So it's a really small collection of acupuncture tools and instruments, but it's a really beautiful collection. It's got all the different important points where you can put acupuncture needles to activate your chi energy in the right way. With acupuncture, the idea is to rebalance yourself. So with the Ramsey artwork, I created a metal exoskeleton or grid that was sort of inspired by a rigid acupuncture meridian force field that I could wear on my body like a piece of armor. I guess I've always wanted to be an artist. Ever since I was a kid, I never really understood what being an artist really meant, but I was good at drawing and I always liked to create things. So as I, as I grew up, I eventually knew that I just wanted to study art and to make art. How did your family feel about that? Of course, they had their expectations out of um, good intentions. They were, you know, they were like, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be an accountant. But I was like, no, I want to be an artist. So, you know, I studied really hard and I got really excellent marks. And then I showed them the marks and then I said, I'm going to take these marks and go study at art school. And what did they say? Uh, nothing. <laughs> they were worried, you know. They were like, oh, you know, your future is uncertain. And, and of course, that, that's fine, but you only get one life. So I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I guess I've been practicing as an artist just over 10 years now. And every time there's a small success, I'll try and share that with them so that they get a sense of the journey that I'm on and that it is progressing and that there is positive change and that there is many opportunities out there. We are at one of the Acme residency studio sites. So it's a three months residency that I've split up into two sections. So I was here for six weeks last year and I'm here on another six week block. Basically, the lens has hijacked the, the history of photography. So when we think about photography, we immediately think about the camera. And I guess I view it a bit like, you know, if you imagine like photography is like a sculpture and it's something that you move around and approach from different angles and, you know, and then I can sort of think about um, photography as an idea, you know, as well. You know, sometimes I might do things like floss my teeth and every morning and every night I'd place the dental floss onto the photo surface. So my saliva, possibly blood, is sort of embedded into that photographic surface. So this is actually done by the hand of my grandmother. I set things up for her and I said, could you please carry on what you're doing but onto this photographic surface. So I really love the idea that it is kind of like a portrait of my grandmother. It's also a portrait of myself. And this work here is actually my tears. So I actually cried into the negative when I was just having an emotional moment, as we all do. <laughs> and what's interesting is that when I'm printing it, it becomes this sort of quite emotional blue, I guess. It's just kind of like the intent somehow manifests. This is the photographic paper that I actually print onto. So I work onto sheet negative, so it's all analog, my process. And I spend time, um, you know, months, weeks, years, exposing my negatives, they're durational in nature. But then I also spend a very long time printing in the darkroom as well by hand. I mean, that's just it when you're an artist, you're a bit of a sponge and just like everything is sort of feeding your work. I want to be doing it all the time. And I think that was, you know, a part of the reason why I want to do the documentary as well is that for women I think it's very important, so for other young women to see other women working. 
because it's, it is about a series of permissions and if you don't see people like you being represented, then you're not going to think that it's possible. <laughs> and um, being involved in the Ramsey or any art prize or anything where an opportunity is presented to you, it gives you permission to keep going. People say that, oh, let's go for holidays. And I tried once to go to holidays, but, you know, chilling on a beach means nothing to me. My mind is, is painting at that time. It's telling me that, what the fuck are you doing here? Why are you not painting? Do you have any hobbies? Painting. <laughs> Do you have any relaxation? Painting. Do you have any other work? Well, this is it. Yeah. This is it. You know, when I'm sad, I'm in the studio. When I'm happy in the studio, when I do nothing in the studio, I dream art and I live art. It's 24 7. Yeah, it's, it's a disorder. It's probably true to say that you're an established artist, is it? No, I'm not an established artist. I am an emerging artist. But your works are all over the place. You've been hanging in Venice, you've had exhibitions all over the world. But does this certify that my career, that I'm an established artist? I always think that I'm an emerging artist. I'm emerging into art. It's not that I am emerging into the world art scene. I am emerging into the art itself and I'm always be an emerging artist. It's not me and art world, it's me and art. The Art Prize will be judged by an eminent panel of three curators. The Art Gallery's inaugural curator of contemporary art, Lee Robb, an artist, Nell, because we believe it's really important to have the views of an artist, and Rana Davenport to be our independent international judge. No, it's not subjective. It's not subjective. I mean, of course, as judges, you're drawing on your professional experience, or in Nell's case, her experience as an artist. You know, decades of experience in the art world, so these are informed decisions. You do spend a lot of time thinking about the works ahead of time, but then I think we all found that once we were confronted by the works in situ, that it actually became doubly hard. Is it a work that's at once timeless, but completely of its time? Is that revealed through the materials? Is that revealed through technique? Is it revealed through scale? Everyone has worked really hard and you can feel that in the work. You know, once you work through quite a lot of different criteria, then that's how you even begin to make a decision. Right now, my strategy with the Ramsey is to consider it like a lottery or even a, a fantasy. I would be very lucky if I won. Everyone would be very lucky if they won. I don't think about sales and winning prizes so much because you can't, you can't hinge your life on that. It's just, it's just more about working hard and doing everything you can.
it's not about the money. To me, winning the Ramsey Art Prize, it was like I achieved my goal. great honour to launch the Ramsey Art Prize today and this will become a very important ongoing legacy project here at the Art Gallery South Australia. I've got no speech because it's uh, much more important that I keep it very quick. On behalf of the James and Dinah Ramsey Foundation, the 2017 Ramsey Art Prize winner. Is Sarah Condos. The Ramsey Quilt started in here at this space um, and then it kind of grew too large so it, I've moved it onto that wall outside and then it grew too big for that wall so then I moved it onto this wall and that's the biggest wall in the house. Doubt is huge, I mean as an artist you have to make so many decisions every day and if you go this direction, it means that that's going to be a couple of hundred dollars and then you work out that that doesn't happen, so you've just lost that money and then you go into this direction and then you go, is this me? What am I trying to say? Is my audience going to get it? It's exhausting in the head sometimes. It's so exhausting. Sometimes the work is so generous and loving and beautiful and at the other times it just kind of slaps you around and you feel very sad, you know, and very alone making it. I think as an artist you need to be committed and obsessive and otherwise I don't think you'll last maybe, I don't know, because it's up to you to get up in the morning and to find the opportunities and to be confident and courageous in what you do. You look at that work and it's a real leap in her practice. It's a, a work full of momentum. It's a pivotal work. It sort of condenses really a decade of making. It totally celebrates power women. It goes back to classical antiquity and goddesses, goes through the golden age of Hollywood, through to Australiana TV, and then, you know, brings you to now. Thank you so much for James and Diana Ramsey. Foundation um, and to Nick and to the judges and to the finalists. I couldn't think I was going to win and I really wanted to and I'm so proud. And um, um, I'm so grateful. <laughs> and, um, and thanks to my friends and family. And um, that's all. I don't know what else to say. Thank you so much. Like, thank you so much. <laughs> I didn't win, but I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> and congratulations to Sarah too. Like, you know, again, so much investment in each of the works. You know, it's easy just to, to look at this, the work in isolation, but you forget that there's years and years and years of work behind um, even getting to the point where you can create something like that. So it's a significant undertaking um, and it's very deserving, I think, so well done to Sarah. It's probably the biggest thing I've ever been in. Yeah, it's massive and it's encouraging that I'm doing something that people are connecting with. So, so that does definitely have a, an impact in the studio and I think it has an impact outside the studio. Look, winning is great, but I don't think not winning is um, uh, going to make a huge impact either. As an artist, you know, we're very resilient. So I've already planned for future projects, um, you know, this year and next year. I mean, the judges told me they had no idea who I was. Like, I, 
I haven't been around very long and I mean I work my butt off and I mean it's really validating to be here. I work really hard, you know, I, I, I do and I think for that to be acknowledged is, is, is worth the hard. <laughs> criteria apart from under 40 and non-media specific that we would like to start looking at across this impossibility. Something that I always look for is can you feel the artist in the work? Can you feel that it can only be them and no one else? It's, it's much more complex than winners and finalists. In I guess a healthy competitive way it does push artists into new spaces and new territories for their work. I think one thing to say is none of us enjoy this process. No, it was, we, we look it was very like happy and yeah, you know, yeah. we, we're still great friends, but um, the reality is a part of all of us is finds this whole competitive process quite abhorrent. Why choose one artist out of 450? And yet this will absolutely make a difference to the life of one artist in particular, but a number of artists as well. I really feel like art satisfies something that no other thing can satisfy. I mean, in the world, we grant it some sort of special privilege to say things that wouldn't ordinarily be said. Making it then also serves some special purpose for us. I don't think I could explain it any other way, except that nothing else that I do would make me feel as satisfied. Mm. I love portraiture because I am uh, fascinated by the human Form. I think this is really the entire reason that I do what I do, actually. It's what gets me up in the morning. My practice is primarily utilising the beautiful and laborious medium of cross-stitch to depict scenes of hardcore pornography. I create income paper drawings and in my work I look at my mixed cultural heritage. I wanted to raise awareness for anxiety and depression uh, so that is the focus of uh, the drawing that I've entered into the Ramsey Art Prize. My work we entered a collaborative artwork into the Ramsey Art Prize. Two we worked together. I think just a lot of things.